Hi, everyone. Welcome to the show. Today, we have the COO of World Team Tennis on, Alan Hardison. Alan, welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me, Well, Super excited to be on. Yeah, I'm excited for this conversation, too. And um, yeah, I wanted to start with uh, kind of my story into World Team Tennis uh, last year. Um, Obviously, we had the pandemic start in March. Uh, the pro circuit gets shut down. Indian Wells uh, gets shut down. I remember where I was. I was actually on the tennis court when that happened, and I was checking Twitter and saw that. And then um, fast forward a few months, and World Team Tennis was one of the first uh, kind of real tennis events to come back uh, after the pandemic. Um, and I remember watching it uh, pretty much every day. I didn't get a lot of work done during those two weeks. <laughs> Um, and there was tennis on all day. There was match after match after match. Uh, and y'all hosted it at the Greenbrier in West Virginia. Uh, the whole season was condensed into two weeks. Um, and I, I really loved the format. Um, so with that said, we fast forward to 2021. And now y'all are doing a two-week event again this year. So what, what can we expect uh, this year um, from World Team Tennis? Yeah, I, I think a heck of a lot of the same. Um, definitely 2020 was, I think, at least for the first time in a long time for World Team Tennis, kind of our our one shining moment, if you will. Like you mentioned, we were one of the the first sports leagues out of the gate, not just tennis. Um, I, 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 I'm pretty sure we were the first league out there to actually have fans in the stands. And as you mentioned, there are so many people who were were captivated captivated by the season and, and how everything right. literally came down to the last point and um, kind of coming out of all of that, um, I think like a lot of people, we kind of realized COVID would still be a thing in 2021. Um, so we moved the season back a little bit to November. Obviously, it's it's still things we anticipated, unfortunately. But um, last year, we gave out this amazing front field, having all the, all the players on the um, like you said, matches all day from a television exposure perspective. Incredible. Our sponsors really loved the fact we kind of own the spec, if you will, because when we go out and we play in nine or 10 different cities, it's it's kind of difficult to um, make sure all of our sponsors are being taken care of and all of our ticket buyers and all of our media partners are being taken care of in all those markets, where as opposed to if we manage everything under our own WTT league umbrella, it makes it a little bit easier. Um, and then player safety was a huge thing too. It's, once again, as we look at 2021, we just we didn't feel it was quite responsible to stick players on commercial flights and fly them around and deal with the health and well-being of players here in 2021. So doing it in one location, again, kind of takes that variable out of it, if you will. Um, you know, what better place to do it than the Indian Wells Tennis Guard? The players love being there. It's it's a very comfortable venue for them, and we're super excited to get going here in just a matter of days. Yeah, yeah, I'm excited for it, too. And I, I was at Indian Wells a few weeks ago uh, for the tournament, and I'll be flying back out for World Team Tennis here in a couple of weeks. So. Um, it's going to be a ton of fun. So you've got your dates lined up November 13th through 28th for everybody listening. Uh, they can get tickets at WTT.com, correct? Nailed it. And then uh, if they can't make it this year, they can watch it on TV. So it, it looks like you'll have uh, the first week is covered by NBC Sports and then uh, for the fans, which I guess is a streaming service. Is that right? Yeah, that's exactly right. Yeah. Part of what we want to do is we want WTT to be accessible for everybody. So if we just did cable in week one, week two, we'd certainly take out some of those, some of the market share, if you will, for the people that might not have NBC Sports Network or Tennis Channel. From a sponsorship perspective, our our partners love those big household numbers that Tennis Channel and NBC Sports Network provides, but a lot of our fans may or may not have access to that based on their own subscriptions or cable networks. So we, we kind of wanted to do a little bit of both. And for the fans offers exactly that. It's a free streaming platform. You can download their app for free or just simply go on forthefans.com and stream the WTT matches there as well. Cool. So, so this is an awesome way to, uh, th- this is a doubles podcast. So it's a lot of doubles fans. So this is an awesome yeah. way to watch really high level doubles. And then it looks like week two is going to be, uh, covered on tennis channel. So at that point, I think the ATP finals will be over. Um, so the ATP WTA season is, is kind of out of the way. And then that's the week of Thanksgiving, uh, here in the States. Um, 
and that will be covered on Tennis Channel. And it looks like you have matches every day at 3 and 6 p.m. Pacific. Is that right? Yeah, just about. There's a couple days in there. Uh, Thanksgiving is one of those days that we've kind of changed the times just so we can get everybody sure. home for Thanksgiving dinner. But yeah, just for the most part, every day, three and six for 16 straight days. Pacific. Awesome. Okay. And so speaking of uh, the the high level doubles we'll be able to watch, there's a few roster updates. Um, so to give people an idea on how high level tennis this is, um, there are tons of ATP and WTA champions, including major champions. So we've got Kim Kleisters, Jack Sock, John Isner, Steve Johnson, uh, a lot of double specialists as well, including Bethany Maddox Sands. Uh, Austin Krychek, who had a really good year this year, Katie McNally, uh, Coco Vandaway, um, several people we've had on the podcast before, including Nick Monroe. Um, so it's going to be some really high level doubles that people get to watch. Uh, are you still working on rosters right now? And what is the process for that kind of look like? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, one of the good things about November and, and now we're finding out one of the bad things about playing in November is um, there's not as much competition on tour right now going up against other ATP and WTA events. Um, mm-hmm. So originally the sign-up list was very, very strong um, and it's still very strong. Unfortunately, though, we have had some dropouts just because we're we're getting close to end of year here. Um, players battling some fatigue, certainly, certainly some players battling some injury. But like you said, our um, our, our roster is first class, top to bottom. Our VP of player operations, Matt Lafont, he oversees all of our recruiting, does just an incredible job with with that aspect of um, of WTT. And yeah, you, you nailed it. I mean, three of our five sets are doubles. Um, so doubles really goes in. You, you need very, very strong doubles in order to win the WTT finals, essentially. So yeah, I know you, sure. you nailed a bunch of those player names, but we also try to recruit a lot of players that – are great two-way players. Um, Jack Sock is one of those phenomenal singles player. I arguably, I think he's one of the best doubles players on the planet when he wants to be. Um, yeah. so we, we definitely try to find that, that fine line of, of singles players that can also compete on the double double score because they, they certainly need to. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and it'll, it'll be exciting to watch for everybody. And I'm sure I will, uh, I'll have some uh, content and podcast episodes for people to to really learn from a lot of a lot of these doubles players as well. So, um, so let's take a step back for a second. Uh, a lot of people, uh, maybe not a lot, but there might be a few people listening who are thinking, "Okay, yeah, I watch the ATP and I watch the WTA. Um, I don't know much about World Team Tennis. Uh, what is World Team Tennis?" Well, yeah, first of all, it, it, it's all the Billie Jean King, all the credit to her. Um, so mm-hmm. She started this league, co-founded this league 46 years ago. World Team Tennis is, is really kind of her life philosophy put together in a sporting event, if you will. So you've got men and women competing together, um, equal contributions to the outcome of the match, equal prize money at the end of the day. Um, we're seeing a lot of that now be... It, it's kind of the cool and the end thing now, but it's our foundation and our core at WTT. We've, we've been speaking this for 46 years here. Thanks to, thanks to Billie Jean and all of her efforts, but we, we have multiple teams that represent multiple cities. This year we have five teams representing uh, Chicago, New York, Orange County, San Diego, and Springfield. Uh, each team will have four to five players, at least at minimum, two men and two women. We'll also have a coach or otherwise known as a captain on each, each team as well. That coach sets the lineup in the order of play every day. And um, once again, those four or five players go out there. They try to represent their city. And um, we play five sets, uh, men's and women's singles, men's and women's doubles, and mixed doubles in every single match. Sets are to five. They move really, really quickly. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and each game is, is essentially worth one point. So every game you can put on the board during those five sets adds up to your cumulative total at the end of the day and determines who wins the match. Yeah. And the, for people listening, the format is really unique. And it's actually one of the things that I, I love about the event because uh, every single game matters. So, you know, when you're watching a normal tennis match, if, if somebody's up, you know, 5-2, uh, especially on the men's side and somebody's serving at 5-2, you might see the returner just kind of throw that game away. But that doesn't happen in world team tennis because if you lose five, three, instead of five, two, that could be the difference. 
uh, in the end. And we'll link to more in the show notes about the format. We don't have to go over all of it here because uh, there is a lot of um, kind of detail on that. Uh, but essentially, there are five sets. You've got the the singles for men's and women's, single uh, doubles for men's and women. And then uh, what's really cool that um, most events don't have, I, I think it's just the majors now, is the mixed doubles. Sure. So you get to see that as well. So um, that's a lot of fun. Uh, so what about looking forward to 2022? Do you expect to keep this two week format or do you expect to go back to, um, to kind of a, a summer league or are you going to see how this plays out and sit down and figure that out? Yeah, that's, that's a million dollar question to us. And I anticipate <laughs> we'll have the answer here probably in, in mid December. Um, okay. what we really want to do on our board of directors wants to do is kind of collect the data from 2021, um, mm-hmm ticket sales data, sponsorship data, get the feedback from our sponsors, certainly our media rights partners. Um, And a lot of that feedback will also be dictated by the players and how we feel the player field lined up in 2021 versus throwaway 2020, because that doesn't count, but versus a typical player field in 2018 or 2019. Are we we seeing more Grand Slam champions? Are we seeing more former world number ones playing? Are we seeing a higher cut line? Um, or maybe, maybe it's worse. Um, but I, I think kind of all that data is, is what we want to crunch with our board of directors and, um, present it all to them and let them make a decision here. So, um, t- to answer your question, we don't have the answer right now. Um, yeah. and, and once again, we just kind of want to see how 2021 plays out here and, and we definitely anticipate to have an answer and a decision on venue and dates and, and all that good stuff here for 2022 at mid December. Sure. Awesome. So, so what, um, what about like a, a fan experience perspective? I know, you know, this year it's obviously out at Indian Wells, which is amazing. Uh, I saw, I think on the website, y'all are doing some like player clinics and stuff like that. Um, what should a fan expect if they're going to attend this season? And, and what are some of your goals kind of moving forward um, as far as improving the fan experience? Yeah, I, I think in short, we're a party with a tennis match going on in between. Um, yeah. It's, it's kind of like how we like to market it. But um, we have a DJ, we have a PA announcer, we're pumping music into the stadium. We're getting the fans riled up. Um, it's it's definitely not your traditional tennis that you'll see at Wimbledon. I think something really cool about WTT is the access that we can offer to our fans, to these players, and also seeing the players really outside of kind of their normal scope of, of the very serious type of athletes that we see on tour, being on a team, it kind of lets them let their guard down a little bit, if you will. Um, yeah. It, it's amazing to see like the difference between the seriousness of a Sloan Stevens playing at the U S open versus when she's coming and playing world team tennis and cheering on her teammates. Um, it's, it, it, it's quite fascinating. The difference we definitely like to get the kids involved. Um, all kids 16 and under get autographs after, after every match on court, um, as you mentioned, we do a lot of clinics and pro-ams. I mean, could you imagine in the NBA if you got to to go out there and shoot some baskets with some of the best players in the league? I mean, it, it would never happen here at WTC. You could pay a couple hundred bucks and join a clinic and hit balls with John Isner and Kim Kleisters. Um, so, so really the access that we offer, kind of the party environment and feel and, and WTT is certainly something that's different that a lot of, a lot of new fans to WTT would enjoy. Yeah, that's it's definitely something that uh, for me watching last year separated it from um, your typical tournament, like you're talking about U.S. Open or Wimbledon or whatever it is, because uh, you get to see the player's personality kind of uh, shine a little more, if you will. Um, I, I feel like a lot of them are a little bit more reserved and rightfully so, right? It's them against one other player versus... I remember watching last year, like Coco Vandaway is on the sidelines when she's not in the match, just going nuts, jumping up and down and stuff. And like, she's got a big personality anyways, but you see that from a lot of players who um, you may not see it from uh, in a normal season. So that, that atmosphere, it's kind of like labor cup, but a little bit more party um, as far as uh, at least from what I saw last year, Um, maybe a little bit of kind of a college atmosphere. Uh, but yeah, it, it was a lot of fun, a lot of fun to watch. 
Yeah, absolutely. You uh, you might have noticed Tennis Sandgren after one of the matches last year. He he downed a beer right on TV. It was I, I've never seen anything like it in sport, and obviously it was was after the match was over, and and he had won, and I, I think he was MVP of the match or whatnot. But um, you know, it's just you'd never see that stuff on tour. It's kind of funny. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, I think I remember that that it kind of reminds me of um, in in golf, like the Ryder Cup. I think Justin Thomas did that. <laughs> Yes. Uh, like a month or so ago on the tee box when he wasn't playing the afternoon session, he, uh, he downed a beer, shotgun to beer on, on the first tee box. Um, <laughs> that's right. So, and, and they went to tennis, went to Tennessee, which is where I'm from. Uh, Justin Thomas went to Alabama. So kind of a, a Southeastern thing, yeah. I, I believe a little bit more so. Yeah, um, definitely. That's the SEC thing. Yeah. Um, so, so what's been the biggest challenge this year, uh, getting, um, getting the season off the ground? And I know, I mean, it's not even here yet, um, but uh, so far, what, what's been the biggest challenge for you? A hundred percent. It's COVID. Um, I, I think um, kind of what we're seeing across the U.S., particularly here on the West Coast, I think probably more than the South, as we just talked about, but there's still hesitancy around COVID. Um, certainly mm-hmm. there's, there's vaccination restrictions that we're dealing with, which kind of cut into your market share of who can come and attend your event, including the kiddos, um, which is once again, very, very core to us at WTT. Um, I have some colleagues over at the Angels where I used to work and all of September, they were selling $3 tickets. And this is a major league baseball franchise that has Shohei Otani, who's having one of the most ridiculous seasons since mm-hmm. the Babe Ruth era, they have Mike Trout. Um, you know, we're, we're seeing some of these NHL teams here kind of struggling with the COVID restrictions. You know, fans fans are just somewhat reserved and and cautious. And, and I, I totally understand that. Um, that's definitely been one of the challenges, just kind of kind of creating the awareness. Um, you know, the, the whole sports scene is just still very uncertain right now. And um, I, I think a lot of us anticipate it will probably be, you know, another year at least before we kind of are, are used to and being comfortable to, to getting back into stadiums and packing stadiums and sitting next to people and, you know, downing hot dogs and beers and, and <laughs> big stadiums like you're seeing them, them do currently in the South here with football. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. So, so what specifically has that, uh, it challenges COVID created for you most? Like, is it going to be like ticket sales or scheduling or something else? Yeah, mo- mo- mostly. Yeah. Once again, just kind of driving people out, getting people out to the stadium um, okay. is, is really the big thing. I, I'm sure you saw with the, the BNP Parva open, um, they have some restrictions set up there where they're not allowing any unvaccinated people on site, um, mm-hmm. including kids, obviously, because kids can't be vaccinated. Um, so us, once again, kind of our core main community at WTT and, and youth and even going back to Billie Jean's story, she used to be a ball kid. And that's kind of how she got into the sport. There was somebody who said, hey, I think you can be an amazing player one day. And that kind of fueled her trajectory is, is she turned, turned pro, uh, if you will. And, um, yeah, that's, that's really kind of been the biggest struggle. Just making sure people are comfortable coming out to the stadium. Um, you know, just us assuring them that this is a safe environment to come out and, and enjoy and watch the tennis. Right. Yeah. Yeah. When I was there a few weeks ago, the, um, I didn't even notice it until like the second or third day I was there, but somebody mentioned, Oh yeah, because you have to be vaccinated nobody's allowed in who's under 12 or under 16 or something. And I was like, Oh yeah, there's, there's no families here. Like I didn't even think about it. Um, and yeah, there was not, it was not very crowded. Um, yeah, it, 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 crowded. it offers the, the kids and the youth, they, they bring energy to any event. I mean, you, you take them mm-hmm. out of a ball game or hockey game or whatever it might be. And, um, they, they bring, they bring the energy and the juice and the jazz to any event. So, you know, certainly without them and they're in it, well, I guess now they can be vaccinated, but, um, still not in time for WTT, but, um, right. yeah, with, without the kids, it, it certainly hurts a little bit. So what are you uh, most excited about going forward? I think just the potential and the opportunity that WTT has, um, mm-hmm. once again, I, I think we're somewhat onto something here. Um, 
we we've kind of turned the tide a little bit. And once again, this is all credit to Matt Alafon, our VP of player operations, but um, kind of in like the, the mid 2010s, um, we really kind of, not that there's anything wrong with that player caliber, but just, just from a marketing and a sponsorship perspective, we, we dipped into a, a lower, lower player field, if you will. Um, and I, I think with last year, once again, that kind of being like a one shining mo- moment for WTT and a lot of these grand slam champions and former world number ones coming out and playing WTT and experiencing it for the first time, just having a phenomenal experience playing WTT. And this year, I mean, the phones were off the hook for us with players trying to get in and, and experience WTT um, kind of knowing what they missed out on last year. So yeah. I think we've, we finally gained some really important ground and momentum in our recruiting battles. Just, I think once again, the players just realize how much fun this is. The money is definitely good compared to your average 250 or 500 event as well. And, we yeah. offer good guarantees and good bonus money. So yeah, I, I think that's definitely, you know, any league or any team is only as good as, as their talent and their athletes. And, you know, that's certainly the case with us. And as we continue to dive into a deeper and stronger player field every year, I think we can continue to grow at WTT and, um, you know, compete with some of the best tournaments in the U S. Cool. Um, so, so why the, uh, Last year you had eight teams. Now you have five. What, what's the reason for that uh, decline there? Yeah, good, good question. Um, so a couple of our franchises, they're independently owned franchises. Um, yeah. Billie Jean actually owns one of them in Philadelphia. But without without the ability to host home matches, um, economically it did not make sense for those teams to participate this year. And we okay. essentially gave them an opt-in or out, opt-out clause for 2021 once again, knowing it was a COVID thing, those those teams are sure. are still very much active in world team tennis. We do anticipate them to come back here in, in 2022, but without being able to procure the local sponsorship and ticket sales that drive those own individual franchise businesses, it made it tough for them to come out and participate um, okay. this year in 2021. Okay, got it. Yeah, that makes tons of sense. So we, we'd expect to see them back uh, probably next year. Definitely. Okay, awesome. Um, so what is, uh, talk us through a day for you. What does a day for you look like? Let's say, um, three scenarios, one right now, uh, like a week and a half before the event during the event, let's say the, the, the middle, uh, of the event and then off season, say like April or something like that. I mean, yeah, even though me, that's not typically an off season or answer yeah, that however me, you'd like. Let me actually start with off season because that's kind okay. of the second our season ends is when the build up for the next year okay. begins. Um, so, so let me start there. I mean, really, the focus in the off season, if you will, or right after this event ends here in November. Um, once again, we'll we'll certainly um, come out and decide with what our format and dates are going to be for 2022. That's kind of step number one. Um, but once mm-hmm. we get through that, really, it's it goes into play recruiting. Um, it certainly goes into all of our media rights stuff, working with our media rights partners, whether it's NBC Sports Network, Tennis Channel, CBS, whatever it might be, making sure we have our schedule lined up. Um, a lot of it's dealing with sponsorship, sponsorship renewals, new business, um, doing things like getting tickets on sale after we find the venue, um, going through our ticket renewals and new business tickets and a lot of the marketing that we do kind of in lead up is, is a lot of what I do on a day to day. Currently right now we're, we're definitely have our operational hats on. We're, we're surfacing the court as we speak out there at stadium two at Indian Wells doing things like, you know, making sure the signage is put up and all of our, our sponsor assets are nicely on display um, dealing mm-hmm. with player hotel rooms, doing all the inbound stuff, making sure our, our trainers and our doctors and our massage therapists are ready to go um, working on credentials. Um, that That's kind of, kind of a little bit of what I'm dealing with now. And then during the season, a lot of the work's kind of been done once we get there. The first couple of days are always a little chaotic and hectic, but once, you know, our part-time staff, our security, our box office, our ticket takers, our ushers, and our, even our full-time staff kind of get back into the swing of it again. Um, once we get through those first couple of days, um, that's a lot of when our work is done and we're just making sure the event is running properly, filling any gaps that are, um, you know, having issues or, or things that we can improve on. Um, but right now is definitely 
uh, the hair on fire time for everybody. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Awesome. Well, I'll, I'll let you go here in a second and put out some of those fires. Um, so a couple of final, uh, kind of rapid fire questions for you. Um, first off, uh, I, I think I read that you played football at Nevada, right? Yeah. You nailed it. Okay. Do you play tennis? Um, you know what? Both of my parents played growing up. They tried to get me into the sport. And it was funny. I kind of radiated more towards the team sports. Okay. Um, my, my dad played division one tennis at UC Riverside. My mom played her whole life. My wife played on tour for like 13 years, but personally, I, I never, um, got into it at a competitive level. But okay. once again, the, the team sport thing for me is like the perfect time. I'm I, I play a lot with my wife. I, I can't say I'm, I'm a great player though. Yeah. Well, it sounds like world team tennis is a good fit for you then. Cause it's got the tennis and then the team sport. So. Exactly. I, I can tell you anything you want to know about the sport, but um, <laughs> yeah, the, the hand-eye coordination for me is not exactly there. <laughs> Do you have a uh, favorite tennis book? Yeah. Pressure is a privilege, Billie Jean. Um, I, I haven't read her new book all in that just came out. I'm, I'm looking forward to reading that, but um, pressure is a privilege is kind of a quote we live by here in the office. And yeah, it's, it's a great book. It's a short read. Um, but yeah, that, I, I definitely lead with that one for now. There's a couple other good ones out there too, such as Pam Shriver's book and, and a handful of others. Sure. Uh, what's your favorite non-tennis book? Non-tennis book. Um think again that's a a great book i just read by by adam grant okay uh what's your favorite tournament favorite tournament tournament on tour man i um that's a great question i i've been to a lot with my wife over the years which has been fun including a lot Mm -hmm. of great ones in europe um I'd have to say probably the best operated event though, from what I've seen. And that's kind of how I look at it working in the industry. Sure. Probably Indian Wells. Really? Yeah. Awesome. Um, what, what did your, your wife played singles or doubles? She played both. Uh, I want to okay. say she hit like 150 in singles. She qualified. She went through qualities, Wimbledon, US Open a couple of times in singles um doubles i want to say she hit a career high of 50 or 55 uh she retired in 2018 at wimbledon wow impressive um let's see what is your do you have a favorite tennis story that you like to tell oh i've got i could could write my own book about this Um, (laughs) favorite tennis story uh gosh there's there's millions um Man, some so, some too personal to tell. Let let, let me see here. Um, <laughs> Take your time. Man. Yeah, no, there's an amazing. Yeah, probably, probably honestly, like just just getting into the sport. I mean, one of what, so 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 what happened is I I was working for the Angels. Um, I had done an internship with World Team Tennis and in WTT called me back and they said, Hey, we've, we've got a spot with the orange County franchise. Do you want to, you want to come in and take a look at this? And, um, you know, it's like, how, how could I say no to this? A great opportunity. And just kind of, kind of cutting my teeth in it, like getting, getting the opportunity to wear a million hats a day. And, and what really opened my eyes to that was like, when I was working with the angels, I didn't, I didn't have an opportunity to, to work with the players. We had 300 people in the front office and, you really mm-hmm. kind of stay in your lane. Um, but what was, yeah. super, what was super cool to me about it is just kind of the interaction that you get to get with these players and the normal people just like you and me, um, which, which was really fun. And I mean, there's, there's just been so many amazing players who've worked with over the years. Rick Leach probably has some of the best stories, but probably, probably my favorite one about world team tennis would be Scott Davis. Uh, we had a team in Vail called the Vail Eagles. This was a long time ago. Okay. And uh, he said they had to ride a chairlift up there in Vail to get up to the match court. I have no idea how they even built the court on. <laughs> but, um, the, the, the fans, the players, everyone would hop on this chairlift at the bottom of the Vail Mountain and 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 go up the top and uh, and then play the match up there at altitude. And, uh, Scott's like, I, I literally couldn't get my serve in. I mean, I must have. Yeah, he's like, I must have hit. You know. Uh, probably one first serve in the whole season. Um, <laughs> kind, of, kind of funny to hear about. There's been so many franchises over the years, and 
um, some of the successes and fail- failures that all these teams have had. Um, it's a lot of fun. But yeah, that that one stands out. Taking the chair left to a tennis match is unique. Oh, wow. That sounds amazing. <laughs> I uh, I played tennis last year in Taos, New Mexico, which is at like 7,000 feet. I think I think Vale taking a ski lift up is, is probably <laughs> 10, 10 or 11,000. But I noticed yeah, yeah, at 7,000 feet, the balls are just flying. Um, yeah. So they, they make those like high altitude balls. But anyways, that's a, yeah. that's a great story. Yeah. Um, awesome. So World Team Tennis coming up November 13th through 28th. Uh, people can buy tickets. They can watch it on TV. Any final requests uh, of the audience? Yeah, come out and, and check us out. I mean, we're we're accessible. We're fan friendly. We've got some of the best players on the planet. Um, we'd love to see you all and, and welcome you all to the WTT season at the beautiful Indian Wells Tennis Garden this fall. Awesome. Well, thanks, Alan, for coming on, and uh, hopefully we will uh, catch up again next season. Yeah, look forward to seeing you out there. Well, thanks so much for having me on. Great honor. If you're a doubles player, you'll love our weekly doubles newsletter. Every Thursday, we send you doubles tips and strategies to help you improve your game and become a smarter player. When you sign up, you'll get a free 10-page guide on how to play with more confidence and dominate at the net in doubles. You can go to thetennistribe.com to sign up now.